us to gather and worship in this virtual experience on today. We thank God for the gift of your presence and worshiping with us on today. We want you to know that we're still exalting Christ. We're still embracing community. We're still engaging culture. Hello, hello, hello from Pleasant Green. Hey, let's worship the God our Father in spirit and in truth. For again, the word says, he is seeking such to worship him. He's not just looking for you to come to worship. He's looking for worshipers. Let's worship the Lord today. Hello, hello, hello. How do you do? At Pleasant Green Baptist Church, we're so glad to see you. We're exalting Christ, embracing community, and engaging culture. Hello, hello, hello from Pleasant Green. Good morning. Remember, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. Let's worship him with the singing of hymns and praising of songs. <clears throat>
Thank you, and I hope you enjoyed the service. Please remember to get the Pleasure Grand Baptist Church. Thank you, and have a wonderful day. Good morning again, brothers and sisters. This morning, our passage is going to come from Psalm 9, and we're still looking at uh, perspective and purpose in our praise. And this praise perspective this morning is going to take a look at God's justice. What does it mean for God to be just? And how does our praise respond to that justice? What does it do for us? And how does it uh, impact us? What can we learn from it? What instruction can we get out of? And so as we look at this perspective of praise this morning in Psalm 9 on doing justice, here are the words that we find from the Lord our God. I will thank the Lord with all my heart. I will declare all of his wondrous works. I will rejoice and boast about you. I will sing about your name most high. When my enemies retreat, they stumble and they perish before you. You have upheld my just cause. You are seated on your throne as a righteous judge. You have rebuked the nations. You have destroyed the wicked. You have erased their name forever and ever. The enemy has come to eternal ruin. You have uprooted the cities, and the very memory of them has perished. But the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for judgment, and he judges the world with righteousness. He executes judgment on the nations with equity. The Lord is a refuge for the persecuted, a refuge in the times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you because you have not abandoned those who seek you, O Lord. Sing to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Proclaim his deeds among the nations. For the one who seeks an accounting for bloodshed remembers thee. He does not forget the cry of the oppressed. Brothers and sisters, this passage on God's justice and what it means for us and how we can learn something for it is a very uh, prescriptive passage for us, especially in today's context, looking at all of the things that we're going through and all of the things that we're dealing with uh, in our society and in our country and in our communities. Justice has to prevail. And we know that the God of our justification is the God of justice. Here in this passage, in the superscript that we did not read, David, according to some scholars, even acknowledges that this psalm is written to the head choir director. It is written to the chief musician. David is referring to God himself in the tune of something called Muff Laban. And I don't really know how to explain all of that, but what I've researched and found is it means death of the son or death of the fool. David is possibly referring to the idea of concerning the death of the champion who went out between the camps. Remember when David had his mighty battle with Goliath. And so it could be referring to that idea. And even that is implies justice because Goliath had been talking about the God of Israel and David was demanding that justice prevail. And as such, so David is here in this passage reflecting and remembering why it is needed, why it is necessary, and why it is a notable thing for him to praise God about that event of justice that took place between David and Goliath. David sees a perspective of God in this Psalm that we should also see. And that is that God will always make sure that justice is done in the earth. And so our first point of the message is because God will always demonstrate his justice in the earth, it is praiseworthy and it demonstrates his integrity. Yes, God's justice demonstrates his integrity. God is the one who has determined what is good in the world. God is the one who ultimately does what is good in the world. It is not necessarily a, a function of man. It is God who does justice. It is God who makes justice sure that justice is done. It is the decisive and deliverable of our experience and declaration of our expression that God is a just and holy 
God. And so in this passage, in verses one through four, we find that David is excited to uh, pen this psalm about justice that has been done in his life and that he has experienced firsthand watching God work through the situations of his life. And so he declares from the very beginning and the onset in this passage that God is worthy of wholehearted praise. It is God's integrity that is worth wholehearted praise. Everything that David is, everything that David has become, everything that has happened and has been good in David's life is because of the wonderful working of a God who was doing justice in and through his life. From the sheepfold to the soldier's field, from taking care of the sheep out in the, out in the pasture to taking hold of the kingdom in the palace, from slaying lions and bears to slaying the one who boasted against God, God had been working wonders in the life of David. And he begins this psalm by acknowledging how good God has been. He gives him a wholehearted praise. He doesn't give him anything that's lacking or anything that's lackluster. He gives him every bit of love from his heart when he makes his declaration and his statement in there that he will bless the Lord with his whole heart. He will give him thanks out of his, the entirety of his being because he does not want to give God anything but that which is wholehearted from him. Wouldn't it be something, brothers and sisters, if we wholeheartedly talked about how good God has been to us every time we ran into somebody in the street rather than the half-hearted ways we usually talk about him now? Child, I'm just trying to make it. I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, I'm just, I'm putting one foot in front of the other. I'm going to get there eventually. I'm trying to fake it till I make it. I'm struggling. It's a tough road to hold. No, David says, God has been good to me. He's brought me over situations and circumstances around hills and valleys, around mountains and curves, things I did not see. David does not allow the lackluster life that some people experience to get him down. David said, I'm going to bless the Lord with everything in me. And we ought to make it clear in our lives that we're going to bless the Lord for whatever he, whatever victory he has brought into our life, even if it hadn't been the victories that we thought we ought to make. But can I give you a simple victory that you get? If you got up this morning, if you listening to this message, you got something to give God wholehearted praise about right now in the name of Jesus. David makes it clear that that won't be his way, that won't should be our way, that that is not enough. It is not enough just to get up and say, okay, God, I'm here. David says with our whole heart, we ought to do and say and, and express ourselves to God that I'm going to bless him with every fiber of my being, every ounce that I got, everything inside of me is worthy of giving God thanks because God's integrity deserves it and it demands it with our whole heart we ought to do. As David does here when he says directly to God, I am going to tell of your marvelous work. I am going to tell of all of the wonders that you have performed. I am going to speak of the integrity by which you watch and work in the world. It is something for me to praise you about. It is something for me to shout about. It is something for me to sing about. It is God who is working wonders in my life. And the least I ought to be able to do is give him praise in the middle of it. David said, not only will I thank you privately, but I will talk about you, tune up in song over you, turn up thinking about you in public as well as private, and I'm going to praise you every place I go. I'm not going to be in any place that I am and not give you the proper credit for that you rightly deserve. Your integrity demands too much out of me to not give you the praise that you rightfully deserve. God, it is your value in my life. It is your worth to 
my, my situation. It is your integrity that has brought me around beings and curves and through dangers seen and unseen. It is you who have brought me here and everybody is going to know it. Even my enemies, those who would call themselves enemies of mine are going to know that I'm going to bless the Lord with my whole heart. And so brothers and sisters, this Psalm shows that David understands that it is God's integrity in bringing about justice that has determined the direction and the destiny of his life. It is God who has been doing the work and watching out for him. David says, I can't take any of the credit. It is God who has been doing. And so he has a reason to, and a right now praise for God in determining and doing justly in his life. God said, David says, it is God's integrity that has put me in this place so that I understand that his justice demands and demonstrates his integrity. And I ought to demonstrate the same integrity in my giving praise to him for what he has done for me, because he has determined it to be so. And I ought to at least declare that he is good and he's good all the time. And secondly, brothers and sisters, the God's justice demonstrates and declares for us in our life that his involvement is always present in our life. God's justice demonstrates his involvement in our life because God will deal with those who are no good. He has already determined what is good. He has done what is good. And then he turns around and says, don't you worry about it. I will deal with those who are behaving as if they are up to no good. David says in verse three, he said that God's integrity has been a determining factor in his life. It has promoted him from place to place and moved him from pilgrim point in his pilgrimage to every point in his pilgrimage. It has gotten him to the destiny that he has, that God has determined for him in his life. And it has been God's doing that has gotten him more than he has ever expected in his life. But David says, that's not enough for me to pray. I can praise him on that and I could stop right there, but I got a further reason I can praise him because God, Justice has dealt with every single one of my enemies. I didn't know which direction my enemies was coming from. I had giants in front of me, in front of me. I had backstabbers behind me. I had a king on the side of me who was trying to kill me. I had Philistines over here. I had these people over there. I had I had even folk ultimately that came in my from my own body that were trying to get I've got enemies all over the place David said but I can't take no credit for defeating my enemy I can't take no credit for defeating Goliath I can't take any credit for anything that has happened to me it was God's involvement and God's intervention in my life that performed, that defeated and dealt with all of my enemies. So I can't deal with my enemies the way that I know that God can, because God not only will defeat my enemies when they dare rise up against me, David says, because of God's justice and involvement in my life, God himself will defend me even when they accuse me falsely. David says, I don't have to worry about going to the courtroom and defending myself and standing in front of the judge and saying anything I'm going to say, God himself will defend me. And brothers and sisters, don't you know that David is suggesting to you and I today that we sometimes when people are accusing us of this and accusing us of that, every now and then we ought to just hold our mule and let God do the talking and the walking on our behalf. He says, God, you have maintained my call. You upheld my case. You provided the discovery in the courtroom. You acted not only as my attorney, but you were the right and righteous judge over the case from the beginning. All I had to do was show up and watch you strut your stuff and then shout hallelujah to your name because you are the righteous judge and you have determined and you are going to deal with my enemies and your justice demands. it. I didn't even have to defend myself, thank God, because I would have been a poor litigator of my own. 
Don't you all remember that saying that only a fool of a lawyer has himself or his own client? I would have been just like that. You would have been just like that. And David says, I ain't no fool. I ain't going to try to represent myself. I ain't going to try to defend myself. I'm going to let the one who knows me better than me and knows all about the situation and circumstances that are before me, I'm going to let him be the one who give, who defends me in this case. But now watch this, now watch this, watch this. Because here is where David turns and he gets real serious. And David almost goes from a moment of praise to a moment of, of solemn of pondering and perspective. And he says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I need you to understand what I'm saying when I say to you that God gets involved in this situation, that God deals with my enemies. I need you to understand that he that David said, I'm not trying to impugn the integrity of God as if somehow God is playing favors and looking at me as some I, I'm somebody special, or if, if God takes bribes or turns a blind eye at what is happening around him to make sure his picks and chooses don't get put up on or pushed around. God does not play favorites. David says, uh-uh, it is the Lord. His integrity is at the highest standard. And David admits that God did not defend him because David deserved something. God defended David because God, because David's actions were in agreement and alignment with God's standard. And brothers and sisters, if our if we expect God to defend us in our daily lives, we've got to make sure that number one, that our lives and our actions are in agreement and alignment with God's already righteous standards and the cause of justice in the world today. David says, uh-uh, it ain't just because my name David. It ain't just because I'm the king. It ain't just because I've been anointed with oil. It ain't just because I tell, took, took from the sheepfold. It ain't just because I slew David that God is defending me in front of my enemies. It's because God's integrity demands that he defend me when I am right with him. And only when I am right with him am I ever right and righteous before him. And so when God is defending me, it means I am right with God and I am righteous before God because the integrity of God is too high and too just and to be unjust, unholy, and corrupt in the justice that he's getting involved in to defend my case. It is God who sits on the throne of judgment and justice. It is God who rebukes the nations and tells them of his displeasure with what they are doing. It is God who disciplines and destroys those who refuse him. It is God who blocks out and removes the names of the wicked ones that reject him. It is God's business to get involved in the affairs of justice and righteousness on our behalf when our actions are in alignment and agreement with what he has already declared in his word, because he has declared that, look, I'm not going to let anything, any weapon formed against you prosper, but you got to make sure that you are not helping to form the weapons against you. It is David, it is our, it is humanity's business to invoke God in those affairs that God gets involved in because his righteousness needs to vindicate us, not us ourselves. We cannot vindicate ourselves, no matter how hard we try, no matter what we try to say, no matter what we try to do. It's always going to be, he said, she said, this said, that said. But when God speaks up on your behalf, you have somebody who can say, Ah, God is saying it and that settles it. It is God's integrity that is at stake in the matters of justice. And so is his involvement in our life. And because of that integrity in doing justice and because of that involvement in demonstrating how justice works, David, you, I, and all of the whole wide world for that matter can celebrate the goodness of God and the grace of God and the greatness of God in every moment of our life, even when we feel like justice has not been delivered in our particular case, even when we somehow think that justice is being delayed too long 
or denied altogether. Even when it looks like justice is wearing the devil's clothes and strutting around in the devil's vineyard, we have to praise God in the midst of the problem and know that justice will prevail and God will protect those who are oppressed by the wicked and wickedness of life. David understands what we are still trying to learn in this country and even in our churches. We have to learn it in our community and our country, in our church and with our social and civic club, in every space we go into, in our cliques and in our club, we need to learn this lesson that David has learned long time ago here in Psalm 9. It is God that is in charge. He is large, he is in charge, and because he's in charge, he gets the final say so. He gets to sit on the throne of judgment and render out justice. He gets to decide what is just and what is not. It is God alone who gets to decide what is right and what is righteousness in every case. Not the Congress, not the courts, not your personal choices, not your cliques, not your church affiliation, not your club affiliation, not what class you in, not what school you went to, nothing but God gets to decide what is right and righteous in this world. And he alone is the righteous judge. Nobody can stay his hand because his judgment is always right. His judgment is always righteousness. And as the righteous judge, who is involved in all of the affairs of justice, we know that even our enemies, which are God's enemies, by the way, and we should not have any enemies that are not God's enemies. If you got an enemy that's not God's enemy, you done made an enemy out of somebody that God says he's a friend of his. And so you got double trouble in your life. If you think that they're your enemy, you need to figure out how to win them back so that you, you can become brothers and sisters or sisters and brothers or whatever else y'all need to become. But if they're not an enemy of God and they're an enemy of yours, then you and that person are enemies with God. And you don't need that kind of trouble in your life. So we need to praise God because we know that our enemies, that they are finished, they are finite, they are fickle, they are foolish because they are enemies of God. If they are enemies of God, they are enemies of our and they are finished. They're going to come down to ruin. They're going to get their just deserve. They're going to get what they deserve. And hallelujah to the lamb. If you ain't praised them yet, you ought to praise God because you know you're not going to get what you deserve. That everybody else is going to get what they deserve. Those who reject God, those who refuse God, those who run away from God, they are going to get what they deserve. And thank God we won't get what we deserve. Here in this passage. David is confident that no matter how bad our enemies and no matter how bad those who oppress us and oppose us and hate on us and treat us, even in today's society, that God is going to get involved. God is going to intervene. God is going to defend us to the end, whether it's today or somewhere in eternity. God is not going to allow your righteousness by his justice to go without his presence and his protection. He is going to show up when you have your showdown. And as my pastor said, he's going to show out in the middle of and strut his stuff so that you can shout out his glory is all the way to heaven. Brothers and sisters, this is a message this morning about God's justice, about his integrity, and about his involvement in every situation of your life that justice is demanded because it, it is needed in your life. And watch this, brothers and sisters, it does not matter how many there are against you. It could be one giant of a man like Goliath in and standing in your way. It could be a group ganging up on you, trying to stop you and hinder you your progress and trying to hold you up from doing what God has asked you to do. It could be an entire godless nation oppressing and opposing you through positions of power and authority and policies that punish you for simply being you or trying to be the you that you're trying to be. God's got your back and God needs you to know that he's going to get involved and get you the justice that you can't get for yourself. He needs you to 
get the understanding in your head that he got you no matter how the world is trying to attack you. There ought to be some people praising him right there because God has involved himself in your life to deal with every one of your enemies and everything that you have to deal with. God knows it all. God sees it all. God can handle it all. But we have to learn to allow God to be our attorney and stop trying to be our own advocate. God's integrity is demanded through his justice. God's involvement is declared through his justice. And watch this, brothers and sisters. The God has an intention, has intentions for his justice. And that is that as he delivers you from the demons and the doubts and the despairs of your life, he can develop you so that you will declare his goodness all over the place. As he delivers you from all of the dangers, all of the stuff that's been going against you, you know that his integrity is on the line. Anytime that you are doing right because it is the right thing to do, anytime you go up against giants and groups that are trying to gang up on you to bring you down, God is going to get involved to ensure that evil does not get its way and that the wicked do not win. And even beyond that, brothers and sisters, God's real and righteous intention for getting involved in your situation is that God wants you and I to know. And yes, indeed, he will deliver you from the wicked and the wickedness. But he wants you to know that when you are distressed and you knew in despair, when you've been oppressed and when you are uh, feeling down and depressed and all of those different things, that he has dug out a place for you. He's dug out a place for you to run to. He's given you a hiding place for you, a place that is in his presence, a place you can run to. He calls it a place of refuge. He is the one you can turn to when your times get tough. He is the one you can trust in, even when it seems like everyone else has abandoned you and left you to the wolves of the world. God is the one whose name we can call on when we are in trouble. We know his name. We know the name to call, but there are some who don't know his name. They don't know who to call. They don't know when to call. They don't know why to call. David is here in this passage, this verse, in verses 11, 10, 10, 11, and 12, reminding us that those who proclaim the name of God among the nations, we are the ones that God intends to praise his name. We are the ones who God intends for those persons who don't know his name to find out his name by. They don't know, but you do know. God intends to use you to show them him. God intends to use you to show them who don't know his name, the one whose name you call on when you need defending, the one whose name you call on when you are in danger, the one whose name you call on when you feel defeated by the world and you're seeking justice in your life. God intends for all of the nations, all of the natural minded, all of the naughty, all of the nasty, all of the narrow, all of the negative, all of the no nonsense having people to ultimately to know his name. And they are going to know his name whether here, near, or there, they are going to know his name because there's going to come a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord who has always been Lord and who is creator of us all. And he intends them to know his name through you and I. And if we don't let them know his name, then God is going to say, why didn't you praise me when you had the chance? Why didn't you praise me? praise my name in advance. Why didn't you let the people know that I am the one who de defended you? I am the one who dealt with all of your stuff. I am the one who determined the goodness in your life. I am the one who declared justice in your life. I am the one whose name you need to proclaim to shout my praise and sing songs of victory over evil in your life. I am the one that, that declares for you to know my name. Watch this. God knows your name. God remembers what you've gone through. God knows what you've been dealing with. God knows what everything that has happened to you. God does not forget what the evil ones may have done to you and he can vindicate you and avenge you. But 
Will you remember his name when he does it? Will you give praise to his name when he defends your just call? Will you make sure that you are declaring his name before the nations and declaring your name even before the negative and the narrow-minded and praising your way through it when it doesn't look like it's going your way? I want you to understand that if you are going to get what your just desserts and what God does, uh, has deserved, designed for you and determined for you. And if you want your enemies to get their just desserts and what he has designed, deserving for them, then you've got to praise God and let him do what he does. Let the devil and the whole wide world know that God has got you. And though enemies try to destroy you, God is going to take care of you. He won't deny you even if the devil tries to delay you or dismay you into doubting the righteous judge who grants you. David helps us know in this song, in these few verses, that God's integrity, his intervening involvement, and his intentions are on the line as a righteous judge. But he's also our kinsman redeemer, and he's our place of refuge that we can run to when life is trying to ruin us. Brothers and sisters, my encouragement for you this morning is to stop fighting and fussing with your enemies. Stop fighting and fussing after your causes. Stop worrying and wondering about what's gonna go down. Stop stressing and struggling. Trust him and trust the one that he sent to hang, bleed, and die on our behalf to make sure that our sins were taken care of, that our injustice was dealt with, that our injustice and our bad thoughts and our bad doing was already dealt with 2,000 years ago on a hill called Calvary by a barefoot brother named Jesus and a brown-skinned brother who came, bled, and died on my behalf. Won't you trust him to save you, to do justice for you, to show you how his integrity can be found in you, how his involvement can help you deal with all of life's situations. Because ultimately, brothers and sisters, it is he who ought to get the prayer. Lord, help us. Praise you in the presence of all of our problems, in the presence of all of our enemies, and those who would cause us problems. Help us to put justice in your hand and trust you as our kinsman redeemer our refuge that we can run to, and the righteous judge that we can praise. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Brothers and sisters, thank God for every one of you that have gathered with us today in this virtual experience. We want to extend the invitation to you right now because there might be somebody out there who needs to know that God's integrity is too important to him for him not to do good in your life. There's somebody out there right now that needs to know that God is ready and willing and able to get involved in your situation, but you've got to give yourself over to him before he will. There's somebody out there right now that needs to know in the name of Jesus that God intends to make sure that his name is known through the praise of his people. We ought to be praising it. If that's you today, won't you connect with us at any of those uh, connection points on your screen? And we'll get in contact with you. We'll walk with you. We'll talk with you. We'll help you get down the road that you're trying to get to. We'll help you to receive God's justice in your life. I know life ain't fair, but it is just. And because God is the God of justice, and he's the God of our justification, even when life is not fair, we can expect his favor. In Jesus' name, amen. Brothers and sisters, thank you all again for joining with us. We thank you all for committing to this time with us every, every Sunday. We thank you for your contributions to this ministry. Uh, your support is so essential to our continuing to do this ministry and do the things that we are doing. We give God all the glory, honor, and praise for you. Those of you who may be considering a contribution to our ministry, the, there's ways to give to our ministry popping up on the screen. We want you to uh, take part in that process. And we promise you, our promise to you 
as a church and as a congregation is that we're going to be good stewards of whatever you give to us because God's words make God's word makes it crystal clear that a, if a man is going to be found faithful, he must be a good steward. And so we give you thanks and glory and honor and praise for that. Listen, brothers and sisters, we're praising God at, and shouting hallelujah all over the place. The numbers continue to come down and we're thankful for that. We had less than a uh, we had less than five, five 6,000 cases over the course of the week, but we still have our young children in school who are unvaccinated, who are still coming down with cases. Teachers are still coming down with cases, but more and more students are getting vaccinated. More and more teachers are getting vaccinated. More and more Mississippians are getting vaccinated, but we still hadn't even reached 50% in the state of Mississippi yet, and that's a shame. And I'm going to go on record and tell you, I disagree with the mayor's decision to not continue the mask mandate in Vicksburg. I wish he would have continued it, but listen, that's his, that's his prerogative. That's what he does. Our responsibility is to continue encouraging persons to get to wear their masks, to get vaccinated, to wash their hands, to watch their distance, and to make sure that they're doing everything to protect not only themselves, but those who they may con come in contact with, and especially those who they, who they love. Make sure that that happens. In Jesus' name, won't you do it? Yes, he will. Listen, let's do that together and let's help mitigate this virus. We have a lot of things on the way uh, that the Vicksburg Ministerial Alliance is connecting with the city of Vicksburg to make sure some things happen so that we can combat this coronavirus together collectively in our communities. We, in, in, we expect to impact over 10,000 people over the, over the course of the next eight to 10 months by making sure that we're encouraging people to do just that, get vaccinated, keep wearing that mask, keep washing the hands, keep watching the distance and watch how God works in the process because he is the God of our justification and he's the God of justice. Now let's hear the benediction for the day. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace and give you peace, and give you peace. Now let the whole church say, Amen. Brothers and sisters, if it be the will of the Lord, because he is just, we'll see you next time.